Hi, welcome to the playlist on the TCA cycle. So this is the playlist on the TCA cycle. And what you're going to find is that before we actually get into the details of the TCA cycle, we have to first generate acetyl CoA. Now, it, the last playlist that you probably watched, or one of the last playlists, was glycolysis. And in glycolysis, we started we started with glucose, right? And we ended up with two pyruvates per glucose, right? Well, the pyruvate that we generate is going to go into the mitochondria. There are transporters in the membrane of the mitochondria, and ultimately the pyruvate ends up in there. And in there, it's going to it's going to meet up with an enzyme complex called the pyruvate, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And what I want to be, I want to be perfectly clear about something. I, I just told you it was a complex of enzymes. And in fact, there are three different enzymes within the complex. Okay. And each of these three enzymes has a very different catalytic activity. So it's a, it is a complex of three enzymes. And I went ahead and drew the enzymes down here. And we typically abbreviate them E1, E2, and E3. And the, the numbers correspond to the order in which the catalysis occurs. The first enzyme is just called pyruvate dehydrogenase. And what, essentially what this enzyme does is it, um, it uses thiamine pyrophosphate to ultimately attach pyruvate to the enzyme. Okay? Enzyme 2 is dihydrolipoyl transacetylase. This is the enzyme that synthesizes acetyl-CoA. And dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, the third enzyme, is the enzyme that ultimately um, synthesizes NADH. Okay, now having said that, I want to be clear about one other thing. The pyruvate dehydrogenase is part of a larger complex, or excuse me, a larger family of other enzymes. It's part of a family of other enzymes, and these enzymes all have the same mechanism and the same cofactors, and they generate the same thing. They're just a family of enzymes, and this family is called the alpha the alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complexes. And actually, when we do the TCA cycle, we're going to run into another one of them. And it's called the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. And, and actually, there are two other really important ones, and they're dehydrogenase complexes for alpha ketoadipate and branch chain alpha keto acids that are generated from isoleucine, valine, and leucine catabolism. And so you have these enzymes scattered throughout the cell, and they all have the exact same organic mechanism. They have the same cofactors. They do the same thing. The only thing different is the substrates that they bind. Okay, so now that we understand that, let's actually look at the mechanism. This is a double bond right there. And what I've done is I've drawn the parts in blue, at least I've circled them in blue, and that's the part that I'm actually going to draw in the mechanism. The reason is, there's two reasons for that. Number one, the other parts of the molecule don't actually participate in the mechanism. And second, I don't want to have to redraw that whole molecule every time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm basically just going to draw these atoms right here. Okay, now the first step, and actually let me say this, the, the, the carbon that I've circled in red is actually the, is going to be the active nucleophile that attaches um, to pyruvate in this case. So the first step is going to be that the enzyme is going to deprotonate. It's going to deprotonate that carbon. And so what you're going to be left with is an, a very, very powerful nucleophile. If you remember from your organic, right, if you remember from your organic, did you ever see a lone pair um, on a double bonded carbon. No, you didn't. It's extremely unstable. So that makes this very reactive. And so when you put in pyruvate, when you put in pyruvate, um, it essentially attacks readily. And so this carbon right here, this carbon is the active electrophile. So this lone pair is going to come in here and attack this carbon. And this bond is going to come out and abstract a proton. Okay. So what we essentially generate is we essentially generate this. So now thiamine pyrophosphate is attached to, it is attached to this guy. Okay, it's attached to what was pyruvate. Right now it's not pyruvate anymore. But anyways, um, now one other thing I want to mention is that this thiamine pyrophosphate is attached to enzyme one. It is a prosthetic group of enzyme one, meaning it is 
It is a prosthetic group of pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, now keep in mind on this oxygen, there's a lone pair. And so what's going to happen is this electron is going to kick in here, right? It's going to kick in there. And essentially what happens is this bond has to go somewhere. So it comes in right here and forms a double bond there. And this electron kicks back onto the nitrogen. And so you end up losing in this step, you lose, you lose carbon dioxide. And let's, let's take a look at what we generate. We end up generating something that looks like this. We end up generating something that looks like this. Okay, now at this point, we've generated an enol, right? Enols are not terribly stable. Um, so this particular molecule doesn't want to be in that form. Well, it turns out that enzyme 2 has, a, has, a, has another prosthetic group, and it's called a dihydrolipoyl lysine group. What does that mean? Well, attached to the enzyme, oops, attached to the enzyme, right? Attached to the enzyme, I have this right here. So let's say I've got my, I've got my protein chain, right? And it just continues on like this, right? I got my protein chain. And one of the R groups is a lysine. So one, two, three, four, right? It's a lysine, but attached to the lysine, or at least ligated to it, there is a lipoic acid attached to it. So I'm going to draw that group in blue so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we have this, actually let me, I'll leave it like that. Anyways, but then we have this sort of disulfide bridge right here. And this part that I'm about to circle, this part is the active... Um, at least it's the active um, component, it's the active component of the, um, at least the catalytic com component of the dihydrolipoyl lysine. And so this is where the enzyme dihydrolipoyl, dihydrolipoyl transacetylase gets its name. Although the transacetylase activity has to do with the fact that it's going to use coenzyme A in just a few minutes. Okay. So we've generated this enol intermediate, and it doesn't like to be like that. So what's going to happen is are these, it's not going to tautomerize in the sense that you would think it would, but this lone pair is going to come back in here, and essentially what's going to happen is this, this double bond is going to come out here and hit this sulfur, and the, the, the disulfide bond between them is going to come out and abstract a proton. So once it, it abstracts the proton, and I'm going to do this over here, let me get my brush. Uh, when, when it comes out and abstracts the proton, you're going to generate something that is sort of an intermediate that, that could, it's sort of an intermediate that contains both prosthetic groups. It contains the thiamine pyrophosphate, and it also contains the dihydrolipoyl lysine. So I'm going to do my best to draw it. So you're going to generate something that looks like this. So you got this, right? And actually, let me go ahead and do this, and you'll see why I'm doing this in a minute. Let me go ahead and draw this with the, the hydrogen sticking off. And now I have my, this double one right there, sulfur. And then I have my, so this is attack the sulfur. So, oops, draw it like this. Make sure one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And that picked up the proton, right? Okay. So essentially what's going to happen now is part of the enzyme, part of the dehydrogenase enzyme, and we'll just call this enzyme 1. So part of the enzyme is going to essentially uh, deprotonate that hydrogen. And that's the reason I drew it. So the, the lone pair is going to come in, and let me do it in blue because I've been doing the mechanism in blue, right? Let me do it in blue. So the lone pair comes in here, abstracts the proton, and these electrons kick back in here, right? And then thiamine pyrophosphate goes bye-bye, right? So what I'm left with is I'm left with the acetyl group attached to enzyme, uh, oops, we have to say, uh, yeah, attached to enzyme 2, right? Because the, the dihydrolipoyl lysine is the prosthetic group of enzyme 2, right? Okay, I have that right. So yeah, thiamine pyrophosphate comes off, right? And it's regenerated to its original form, right? So what I'm left with essentially is this. I'm left with this. 
So now the acetyl group is attached to there. And so essentially what I have at this point is a semi-reduced dihydryl lipoyl lysine. It's semi-reduced. What does that mean? Well, if I look back at what I started with, right, this was in a disulfide bridge right here, right? It, it was totally oxidized at that point, right? Now, one of them has been reduced to a thiol, but one of them has not. So what we call this typically, this is the semi this is the semi-reduced version of the dihydro lipoyl lysine, right? Semi-reduced. Okay. Now, what's going to happen next, and this is catalyzed by the second enzyme. So this is, this is specifically the activity of, of the dihydro lipoyl lysine uh, transacetylase. Essentially what's happening is you're going to have coenzyme A come in. And remember, the thiol group has a lone pair, and it's going to come in and do a nucleophilic acyl substitution, just like we've seen a million times, right? And this guy comes out and extracts a proton. So what am I left with? Well, essentially what you get is two things. Number one, number one, you get acetyl-CoA, right? And let me do that in a bold color. You get acetyl-CoA, right? And that's good, right? And actually it's the acetyl-CoA that goes into the TCA cycle and gets consumed by citrate synthase, right? And we'll, we'll look at acetyl-CoA in more detail in just a minute. But suffice it, suffice it to say for now, we've got the acetyl-CoA. But here's the problem. Now what we have is we have a totally reduced version. We have a totally reduced version of the dihydryl lipoyl lysine, right? Well, if you recall, by definition, an enzyme has to regenerate itself at the end of a reaction, right? And so if we look at how it started, it started in the totally oxidized disulfide bridge version. So we have to somehow, in order to you know, have this called an enzyme, we have to be, give it the, the, the defining feature of an enzyme. We have to regenerate how it originally was. And that is performed ultimately by the enzyme 3. So to give myself room, I'm going to come over here. And this is catalyzed by the third enzyme, dihydrolipoil uh, dehydrogenase. And specifically, FAD is going to, do the, or going to do the oxidation. So FAD itself is getting reduced to FADH2, right? And so what we end up generating is we end up generating the totally, the totally oxidized version again. And of course, then, that's the prosthetic group of enzyme 2, and we've regenerated enzyme 2. But here's the problem. One thing you must understand about FAD is that FAD is very tightly bound to the enzyme. In other words, enzyme 3, it's very tightly bound here. In a sense, you could sort of, I mean, sort of, I mean, you can consider it, it is basically part of the enzyme. It, it binds so tightly. So not only do we have to regenerate those other two cofactors, but we also have to regenerate FAD. So we got a problem. We have FADH2. Well, it turns out that there's another cofactor that's going to come in, and it doesn't bind tightly at all. In fact, it just comes in transiently, and it's going to pick up the electrons from FADH2 and regenerate FAD. And that is going to be, that is going to be, and let me, let me do this, that is going to be, it is going to be NAD. So NAD is going to come in, right? NAD is going to come in, let me do it in purple. NAD is going to come in, and it's going to take the electrons from FAD. It's going to become NADH, and the NADH is just going to float away, and it's just going to go into the electron transport chain. If you really want to get specific, it's going to get reoxidized to NAD by the action of the enzyme NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase. Okay, and then of course that regenerates that regenerates FAD. So what have we seen? Well, we've regenerated, we regenerated thiamine pyrophosphate, where did we regenerate it? We regenerated it in, we regenerated it right here, right here, we regener regenerated thiamine pyrophosphate. Here, in, in this step, we regenerated the uh, dihydrolipolysine, and in the last step, by, um, by dihydrolipolysine dehydrogenase, we regenerate FAD. So remember, by definition, an enzyme, and, and really in general, a catalyst, has to regenerate itself at the end of the catalysis. Otherwise, it can't be considered an enzyme or, or a catalyst, right? Because enzymes are biological catalysts. So ultimately, what this enzyme complex does is it creates acetyl-CoA. 
So we lose carbon dioxide, we generate NADH, and generate an acetyl-CoA. Now acetyl-CoA, let me go back to the structure and actually just abbreviate its structure, right? Acetyl-CoA has really two functions. Number one, it gets consumed by citrate synthase. And of course that is in the TCA cycle. So citrate synthase has two substrates. It has acetyl-CoA and it has oxaloacetate. And ultimately in this case, in this function, we'll call this function one, it's fueling the TCA cycle. Okay, so in order to fuel the TCA cycle, you have to be using this enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to be making acetyl-CoA. The other function of it is, is a much broader function, and this function is just simply acetyl, acetyl transferases. And acetyl transferases exist all over the cell, and essentially what they are is they're, they're in reaction schemes, and they're just enzymes that, that, that use acetyl-CoA to transfer acetyl groups. And just as this is just off the top of my head, when I immediately when I thought of this, I thought of morphine biosynthesis. You've probably heard of morphine, and it turns out morphine is a biomolecule, and one of the enzymes in the reaction scheme is salutaridinyl O-acetyltransferase. So sometimes en enzymes will require ac acetyl-CoA to transfer acetyl groups to molecules. So these are the two general functions of acetyl-CoA. Okay, and and of course, this is catalyzed by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And really, the important thing about this mechanism is really that um, what you learn here carries over to all the other enzyme complexes. And that includes the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, the alpha ketoadipate dehydrogenase complex, the, you know, the, um, what was the other one? The, uh, the branch chain alpha ketoacid dehydrogenase complex. These are the four most important uh, types of these enzymes. And, and to be honest, like I mentioned, they all have the same organic mechanism. They have the same cofactors, and they have the same, you know, they have the same, um, you know, that you you lose carbon dioxide, you generate acetyl co, or no, not acetyl co, you generate a coenzyme A derivative, and you generate an NADH. This is the only one that generates acetyl CoA. For instance, in the case of um, alpha ketoadipate, you end up generating glutaconyl CoA. But anyways. Um, and actually, in the case of the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, you end up generating succinyl CoA. And succinyl CoA, is, again, is part of the TCA cycle. Okay, so I hope this video helped you really get to know the, at least the, the how the pyruvate, dehydro, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex works. And in the next video, we're actually going to go into the function of the TCA cycle. See you soon.